Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. It's a, it's a great uh, privilege and it's an honour to talk to Paul. As we do relatively often, have done over the last few years, I've given him a hard time on my radio programme a couple of times. Very true. <laughs> and I was, I was thinking about the introduction of President of the Royal Society, although actually President of the Royal Society until about eight days ago, wasn't it? Absolutely. I stepped down two weeks ago. And do you feel a bit demob happy about that? I feel freer to say what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good for all you guys. Uh, previously, you were president of Rockefeller University, head of Cancer Research UK, the Copley Prize. That's a good one. That's, uh, that's the, I believe, that's the oldest scientific medal on Earth. It is. It was, um, it's a Royal Society medal, given one each year. Founded in 1731, so it's the oldest medal. Yes, you've done your history. Um, and, you know, general all-round nice guy, to be, to be mm. honest. Mm. Well, let's see if I can extract Ask that my family that. Out, yeah. <laughs> out of you. So I'm going to start with a really important question. Uh, what do you think of the new Star Wars film? <laughs> well, I like the old one. The bar scene was magnificent. And I'm saving up the new one, maybe for this weekend. Have you seen it? it uh, yeah, I have, actually, yeah. Oh. It's been out for 12 hours and you haven't seen it. <laughs> See, we do expect better from scientists than that, but I'll let it pass this time. So I am gonna st I I'm properly going to start with a... Um, I, I mean, you must get this all the time, but I suppose you spend more time hanging out with Nobel Prize winners than most people. What is it like getting that call from Sweden early in the morning Sometime in, when is it, March, I think? Um, October. October. <laughs> yeah, almost, almost right, <laughs> almost right. Well, you know, uh, I heard in a slightly strange way, I was in an office in London with Jim Watson of Watson and Crick, and we were talking to um, philanthropists about raising money for Gregor Mendel's monastery um, to establish a museum for Mendel. And pretty, I, pretty much a you know, standard one, Tuesday. <laughs> yes, as one does, yes. And um, I, uh, there, were, um, there was a message into the office um, which asked me to turn on my mobile phone. Now, I was just over 50, and so my mobile phone was obviously off. You know, you uh, don't keep it on. And I um, turned it on, I went just out of the room, and there was a recorded message and there was a Swedish accent, which, as you know, is like somebody speaking with a hot potato in their mouth. Yeah. <laughs> and I listened to it, and I heard the word Nobel and so on in it, and I thought, they're asking me to comment on who won the Nobel Prize. I just didn't pick up that it was me who had um, who'd got it. And then I had to sort of go back and listen to it again, and I'm not very good at this sort of technology. And then it gradually dawned on me they were talking about me. And so I listened to it for a third time. Then I went back into the room and I said, do excuse me, I've got to go now because I think I've won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> really true. And I went back to my office to um, just confirm it all. How did Jim Watson take that? Because, of course, he, he already picked up his in the 60s. He said, who have you won it with? <laughs> Yes. Do you know I said, what? I don't know. <laughs> I can actually believe that that would have been his response. There's a lot of... Um, no, the Nobel Prizes really are the only recognition that scientists get beyond the field of scientists. How, did it change you? Did it change your outlook? Did it, it certainly changed your status, but what about, you know, how you...? I think that it, it, you're quite right, Adam. It's the only a prize in science that's really known about in the public at, at large. So you are suddenly catapulted into becoming a minor, very minor, but a minor celebrity. And um, that has consequences. There is a disease that people get. I call it nobilitis. Where that's, that's my next question, actually. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll answer. <laughs> I didn't know that. And because people think that you know something about everything. and Nobel laureates have a tendency to start believing that they know something about everything. And that's really dangerous, because obviously <laughs> you do not. So you have to watch for that. Um, the real problem for being just a normal person is like having another job. Nearly daily I get asked to 
speak somewhere, to open something, to do something. And I have these hundreds of different ways of saying it politely, no. <laughs> and yet here we are on stage. Actually, you've said, stage. you've said no to me a fair few times, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. But what, what fact, is only a week ago, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Um, but, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> but what sort of things are people expecting you to say? The Nobel Prize comes as a result of your research, specifically an area of your, your research. Yeah. And we're going to talk about that in yeah. a minute. Yeah. But then you get calls up from people, well, I guess people like me. Well, th there's a, a lot of questions about science, and some of them are around areas that I do know something about, the same as you, genetics, cell and molecular biology, um, a bit about biomedicine disease. Then, of course, it, it extends into other parts about science, about which I can comment about the process of science, about how science is done. But then I'm certainly not an expert on fracking or climate change or all sorts of other things. Um, I can read up about it and I know where to look for the right sorts of answers. Um, but people think that you're expert there. But then they also want you to sign petitions about all sorts of different things. And I've uh, taken uh, the view that I don't do that unless I really do know something about what I'm being asked to um, uh, adopt or uh, support. There is a sense certainly within the media, certain, you know, within my colleagues to a certain extent, where if you've identified someone who is a good talker and is a successful scientist and is a, has a statesman-like disposition, I, I mean you, <laughs> um, that you're right, you're familiar enough beyond the field of yeast genetics or cell cycle regulators that within 20 minutes you could be pretty much a relative expert on any branch of, of science. I can say something. I'm certainly not an expert. And um, I often say that we really do, over complex issues like climate change, need to talk to the experts. What I can do is give a potted version of that. And I'm prepared to do that. But it's still the experts that need to be consulted. Do you think that we value experts, expertise in this country as much as this is a pretty loaded question, because mm -hmm. I think the answer is no. Um, but uh, compared to France, for example? Well, we don't compare high-quality scientists with high-quality footballers, for example. I mean, we're nowhere, right? But I will say that the UK does take science fairly seriously. Certainly, actually, our political masters, they, they do listen to scientists. We're in no sense high up in the media interest, I would say, not really. Um, but um, at the same time, um, we, we do have a presence. And uh, um, I'm reasonably comfortable with how the UK as a whole handles science. I think, in fact, over complex issues like stem cells and, and so on, we have probably the best approach and regulations in, in the world. So uh, seriously, we're good at it. But we're not celebrities. And, and, and actually, that's quite right. We shouldn't be. Yes, I agree. And I do think we do measurably punch higher than our weight, and I think we consistently have done for about 400 years. The, uh, honestly, uh, science is, uh, Britain is one of the great countries in the world at science. Many uh, could argue that it is um, the greatest country. America has much bigger quantity, it invests much more, um, but per capita, we definitely are. We are very, very effective. And that isn't really known out there, I mean, as much as perhaps it, it should be. Part of my job as president of Royal Society, of course, was to, um, was to um, make that point repeatedly um, to um, the politicians. So I'm going to come on to that later. I do want to talk about that because that is, has been an important part of your, your uh, jobs yeah. over the last few years. But we, we started by talking about the Nobel. I mentioned that it's for specific research, as all Nobel Prizes in science are. So why don't you give us the potted history of how you got to 2001's little gold medal? Well, what my laboratory discovered, and you have to understand that these are very cooperative and collaborative efforts, and um, there's many people who have contributed to it, as well as two others who won the Nobel Prize with me. What we worked on um, was what controlled the reproduction of cells from one to two. Now, we are all made up of billions of cells. We're were derived from a single cell. We were all once a single cell, all of us. And 
the basis of all growth and development and for that matter reproduction is to be found in the understanding of the reproduction of a cell from one to two. And what my lab did was to identify the genetic network that controlled that process of reproduction, the start of it, the copying of chromosomes, the hereditary material, the DNA, which has to occur every time a cell reproduces. Also, the bringing about of what's called mitosis, that's the segregation of those chromosomes into two newly divided cells. And all of that's controlled by network that was discovered in yeast, and that's what I worked on, and which we worked out how all those uh, components, there's not very many of them, but they're very, very important for regulating that process, um, and we showed it in yeast and then showed it worked in exactly the same way in human beings as well. And the implication of that is that since yeast and human beings are controlled in the same way, this was a mechanism that was probably uh, put in place by evolution 1.5 billion years ago. Dinosaurs were 65 million years ago, they went extinct, so that's just a blink in time in comparison. So every living thing that we can see around us nearly is controlled, the reproduction of their cells in exactly the same way. And given that it's so universal, that mechanism is so universal across all, all species, it has really significant applications in terms of us understanding diseases such as, such as cancer? It really does because firstly it means that we can study diseases like cancer in simple organisms like yeast or flies or worms which are, are much more uh, uh, amenable for study where it's cheaper and you can do things 10, 30 times faster and then use that as a model for understanding how it works in more complicated organisms such as ourselves. It's particularly relevant for cancer as you said because all cancers are uncontrolled cell reproduction, and cancer is generated mostly by damage to genes that are important for cancer, and that's a very much an important aspect of the copying of DNA and the segregation of DNA, which occurs every time a cell reproduces itself. And I know that most research scientists don't do research that is directly applied, and we don't, we don't conduct science necessarily in order to um, derive applications, but was that something that was always in your mind? People who work on the cell cycle know that a lot of the drive for it and a lot of the funding for it comes directly from people who are putting coins in, in collection pots. I think what I, when I started on it, which was in my 20s, so you know, a long, quite a long time ago now, as you can see by the colour of my hair, <laughs> um, I was really interested more in the understanding this basic biological process. I of course knew that it would be relevant for cancer in some way, but I think I was driven more by the curiosity of trying to understand this part of the natural world. I also was not sure whether what I was going to work on in yeast would be applicable to everything in the way that it turned out to be, but I knew there was a chance that it would be. And if it was the case, then I knew it would be an important way of studying disease. The, the Nobel Prize Committee absolutely annotated the prize of its relevance to cancer uh, um, uh, um, and to thinking about the disease. The way I probably explain it is that um, you cannot think sensibly about how you can treat cancer without knowing what was discovered here. It's not so much that it's immediately applicable, but you cannot think of applications in a sensible way without knowing what was discovered in this way.